Hello and welcome back to the Ocean Impact Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Silverwood, and this is a brand new season of the podcast. We've had a little break, but we're back with a range of fantastic guests who are here to share stories of how we can improve the health of planet Ocean through inspiration, innovation, and of course, good business. And who do we have up first on the podcast? It's none other than Professor Tim Flannery, who is an absolute idol of mine. So you will note in this podcast, I'm a little bit gushy. I'm a very excited young man looking up to my idol, Professor Tim, who has done so much to shape my thinking and my motivation to be the best environmentalist that I can. So naturally, the conversation is really geared towards the state of the climate and how we really have got no time to waste when it comes to improving the way we do things to minimize the amount of carbon that is being released from our human activities and now from natural environments into our fragile atmosphere. If you don't know much about Professor Tim Flannery, he is an extraordinary human. He's been Australian of the Year in 2007. He started his career as a paleontologist and a mammologist. He was an explorer. He's uh, discovered something like 30 mammal species, many up into Papua New Guinea and remote regions of the world. But really in the last 15 years since he saw in his own eyes the impacts of climate change, he has become one of the boldest and most clear communicators on the climate crisis through his books and through his, uh, his, his incredible presence. We talk a bit about in the podcast his new book, The Climate Cure, which I suppose looks at our human response to the COVID-19 pandemic and how we can take a lot of lessons in how we need to treat the climate crisis in a very similar systematic and science-oriented way. So I thoroughly enjoyed the podcast. I hope you do too. He's a real boon to have Professor Tim in our ecosystem. He's madly passionate about marine permaculture and huge seaweed forests out there, massive opportunities to draw down carbon because as he obviously realizes that every single year we do not act on reducing our carbon emissions means we need to then double down on drawdown, on sequestering carbon out of the ocean and out of the atmosphere. If you like the conversation, if you like the podcast, please consider writing a review, just giving us a few of those uh, stars that we love so much because we really think that more people need to know about this podcast in order to keep building this movement, which is saying that, hey, innovation for a sustainable ocean needs to be a big focus into the future. There is a lot of opportunity out there and OIO is playing our part. So Thanks again for being one of our valued listeners. We can't wait to bring more conversations to you as we keep releasing these episodes of the Ocean Impact Podcast. Very thrilled, ecstatic actually, to have on the Ocean Impact podcast today, Professor Tim Flannery, someone who I hold in such high regard and uh, I'm not the only one. Um, Thank you for taking the time out, Tim. Uh, I'm really looking forward to today's conversation. It's a pleasure, Tim. It's great to be with you. So you've written so many profound things that I have read and that have impacted me, but there was some in your your series of essays, Life, your selected writings, which maybe I'd missed them in previous texts of yours, um, but they really, to me, solidified the language around that we live on planet ocean. You put the ocean into such a unique context that just made me realise, duh, humanity start treating the ocean with much more respect. I was wondering if um, if you might be able to recall some of those and maybe just take the, the listeners on a little bit of a ride around why the ocean is so central to our planet's function. Well, Tim, that's a great question. It's taken me a lifetime to sort of uh, understand. And even then, I'm not sure I fully understand it, but understand the importance of the ocean. Um, you know, I, I guess 
you know, if you look out, look out your window now, you'll see land, most likely, you might see a bit of ocean and you'll see lots of atmosphere. And it gives you the sense that the atmosphere is really big um, and the ocean is there, but you know, it's significant, but not that big. But if you do a direct comparison of the mass of the oceans and the mass of the atmosphere, you, you see that the oceans are 500 times larger than the atmosphere, right? 500 times bigger. I mean, there's a whole nother atmosphere worth of gas dissolved into the ocean. You know, and the biggest habitat on earth by far is the, is the zone below 3000 meters, you know, the ocean abyss, the abyssal zone. Uh, you know, there's more life down there than almost anywhere else. It's amazing. So, and you know, because it's so big, uh, the ocean has played a really fundamental role in terms of regulating the climate of the planet. It's sort of like a juggernaut, you know, it's kind of slow to change, but once it starts to change, it can change everything. Like, um, you know, it's like having a mighty, a huge machine, you know, you know, perched on a precipice. And once you tip it over, it'll, it'll just take over. So I treat the ocean with new respect now, and I watch some of the changes in the ocean that we see with, with, some, or with some trepidation, I must say. Absolutely. And to try and have that as more common knowledge that the volume of the ocean is 500 times more than our atmosphere, because we look at the atmosphere as this cradle to, to, to hold this biosphere that we all function within, yet, it is the ocean which is dictating so much about the atmosphere. What was the other stat that you mentioned in that book around the terrestrial land mass, the, the, the mass of land above, I guess, the high tide line and how that compares to the volume of the ocean? You know, it's tiny again. I mean, as I said, the, the biggest habitat on earth by far is the zone below 3000 meters. You know, that is, that's, I think it's, I've got to get the figures right, but something like 80 to 90% of the total biome of the planet. It's, it's just enormous, you know. So, it's, and so that, what happens down there in terms of chemistry, temperature, and all the rest of it is the kind of, it's the hidden puppet master for the whole planet, you know, for the climate system and health of the entire planet. Mm, and we're going to get right into a conversation about solutions and actions to, uh, to ultimately help us and every other living creature that we share this beautiful pale blue marble with but let's go way back your obviously early career was really um guided by a fascination with terrestrial wild creatures um and you can talk a little bit about that but i wanted to know when the ocean started uh, captivating you did the ocean come first did wild creatures come first tell us a little bit about those early inspirations and experiences Oh, well, Tim, I grew up um, around Port Phillip Bay in Melbourne, you know, in the 1950s and, and 1960s. And, um, you know, back then, environmentalism was sort of, God, it was unknown, really. It was a dirty word in many ways. Um, and around where I grew up, I was only about, I suppose, I don't know, 20 kilometres from Melbourne. But um, there was a lot of wild land back there even then, a lot of bushland. And as a little kid, I remember playing in the bush, making cubby houses and just watching lizards and birds and things, you know. But by the time I was in my early teens, all of that stuff had been, all of the bushland had been cleared and replaced with houses. It was that kind of active urban fringe, you know. So, and I really hated seeing that. And the one area that didn't change was the bay, you know. So I ended up spending increasing time down in the bay with a snorkel and mask in this amazing environment. Even though it was freezing in winter down there, I can tell you. Um, but but uh, watching this marvelous panorama of life. And to me, that was, it was a real lifeline because I, I, I remember asking my mum why the world was changing the way it was. And she just said, oh, that's progress. And that really disconcerted me. I thought, God, if that's progress, I really don't want to have anything to do with it. So. I think growing up in that maelstrom of, you know, conversion of native bushland into suburbs had a really big impact on me. And the ocean was always a, my refuge, the place I'll go and see that it wasn't changing. You know? So then the adventurous spirit well and truly bit you. Uh, did I hear correctly that you, you, you grabbed a motorbike and around the country you went? Is, is that where the adventurous in you was, was truly born or nurtured? 
Mm, yeah, it's hard to say. I, look, I did a lot of, I, I learned to scuba dive and I did a lot of scuba diving around the bay and outside the bay. And that was pretty adventurous back then. I mean, some of the Southern Victorian coast is not for the faint hearted, you know, it, it's interesting stuff to go into. And it was beautiful. It was these great kelp forests and, you know, wobbegong sharks and, and, and caves full of crayfish. It was beautiful stuff. But I guess I, I, I was increasingly aware that having grown up in Melbourne, I really didn't know Australia very much. The, tr the streets were full of European trees and European birds back then. There wasn't a much of a native kind of planting initiative anywhere. And things looked pretty bleak to me. So I think I must've been about 19 and uh, mate and I had similar motorbikes. We just decided we we're gonna go around Australia very naively <laughs> because back then there was about 1200 kilometers of unpaved road around in up in the Northwest. But we, we took our motorbikes and off we headed. And I, you know, I saw the Nullarbor Plain and the southwest of WA and it got to Broome before, you know, Lord McAlpine had converted into a tourist attraction, met Aboriginal people, just had a great time. You know, it was fantastic. And so then what was the next stage of your life? Obviously, you really got into mammalogy and your studies of uh, marsupials of Australia. And that took you to PNG. Maybe share a couple of those uh, moments in your life that really set the stage for what would ultimately be your your scientific and academic endeavours. Sure. Well, I look. I was always volunteering at the Museum of Victoria, and um, the curator of fossils there would take me on various digs. So we started off going to places close to home, like Bacchus Marsh and Western Victoria. But after a while, he was planning trips like out to Central Australia and and to Southwest Queensland. And that was fantastic. You know, you got in the four wheel drive, you left the beaten track behind. I remember we drove up into one area um, north of Lake Eyre and uh, there's a series of little salt lakes up there. And uh, one of them, you know, it's the bleakest country you can ever imagine. It's just, God, dry, dry, dry and salty. And um, there was one salt lake and I found little pebbles around the outside of it. And I thought that's kind of unusual. Pebbles usually mean there's streams, you know, around the place. So we dug in anyway with a, with, a, with a mattock and went through about half a metre of this stinking black clay, you know, the kind of stuff you get around salt lakes, really stinks like sour. And then we hit into this kind of grey clay and I remember picking a piece up and smelling it and it just smelled like a rainforest. It was amazing, you know, and it was 15 million years old, this clay. It had formed when there was a rainforest in central Australia. And I remember picking a leaf out of it that I could bend in my fingers still, it was so well preserved, but within a minute, it dried out and just kind of crumbled into dust. It was this yeah. amazing experience. And so I was hooked then on time travel and you know rainforest and change and all the rest of it. So I did lots of other paleo work, but I then had my heart set on going to New Guinea where the Australian rainforest really survives on a grand scale, you know. So in 1981, when I was uh, 25, I was lucky enough to make my first trip to New Guinea. And that was it then. Uh, you know, I, I, I just fell in love with the place, with the human cultures, with the, the and the biodiversity, the grand landscapes, the whole thing. And so I spent most of my active career as a biologist in PNG and uh, West Papua and Solomon Islands and places like that. What if you wouldn't mind recounting the reflections, I suppose, that emerged later in life where the changes you were experiencing in the high country of Papua New Guinea ended up becoming the reality check that you were witnessing the impacts of, of climate change firsthand? Yeah, sure. Well, look, Tim, I remember my very first trip to, to PNG back in 1981, and we climbed a high mountain. It's only about 120 kilometres from Port Moresby. Um, but you know, three, 4,000 metres high. And um, we got up to about 3,200 metres and got into a big basin that was all just grassland, alpine grassland. And um, I remember seeing around the edges of the basin that trees were encroaching on it. And I thought, that's kind of weird. I thought maybe people have changed their burning habits or something had changed. But I realised in subsequent expeditions that everywhere I went, it was the same story. On every high mountain, the tree line was advancing. And I realized then that the climate was changing, you know, and you talk to the older, older men particularly, but women as well, but the old hunters I used to go out with in New Guinea, they're the great professors of biology, you know, and they would tell you what was changing and how things were changing, and what the, the environment was. So I kind of learned at the feet of the truly great experts in that area and was really forever grateful um, 
to them and for that experience for showing me these real impacts in the world that I didn't know then, but I'd spend the rest of my life trying to do something about. The other poignant moment um, I learned when researching for the podcast was, you know, your first experience with the Great Barrier Reef was on the eve almost, only a few years prior to the first bleaching event. I wonder if you wouldn't mind um, telling us a little bit about that. Sure. Well, that would have been 1972, I reckon, or 73. Um, I took my motorbike again, drove up to Cairns with my cousin and a few friends and went out onto the reef and it was glorious. I still remember, I was snorkeling, I wasn't uh, scuba diving, I couldn't carry the tank on the bike, but, uh, but we went up snorkeling and it was just glorious. And um, I didn't know, I had no appreciation that this was, you know, at all going to be a special thing. I just fell in love with it, thought it was great. Um, but then about three years later in 76, we had the first big bleaching event. You know, and since then there's been one bleaching event after the other. And there was a couple of decades where I was working in PNG where I didn't really get to the reef. But when I did get back and saw how damaged it was, it was kind of heartbreaking really. Um, and every time I go back, I feel, you see it, it's not always more degraded, but the general trend is not good. You know, you see more areas damaged that, that were, were once, you know, undamaged and beautiful. And I think about it, you know, for my children, God, you know, I've taken them, my older ones, up onto the reef. And I think when they're my age, what will they be looking at? You know, we've, we've got to do something, Tim, about it. We can't let that just continue to degrade the way it is. Mm, yeah. I get, a bit, you know, emotional, mate, just knowing how much you have put into a rational understanding of the state, the precipice that we stand upon. But here we are, we're in 2021. Um, mm. The new book, I suppose, is a really great avenue for you to say, okay, you've just listened to the science, you've just developed plans, you've executed plans, and they're working. How on earth can we leverage off this to create meaningful change? You want to tell us a little bit about the new book, The Climate Cure, Solving the Climate Emergency in the Era of COVID-19, and how that sure. frames your your current efforts? Yeah, well, look, it, it was written in a pretty despairing moment, Tim, really. I, uh, you know, we, we had Trump in the White House. We had the news from science was just getting worse and worse and worse. It looked like Trump was going to win a second term. Um, my mum, just on my personal front, my mum was um, dying through that year, so it was really hard to concentrate. I was in Melbourne every second week with her trying to you know, manage to keep her at home so she could enjoy some quality of life. And um, I found it really hard to write that book. It's the hardest book I've ever written, really. Um, and I say at the start, you know, I, I don't want it to be an obituary for the planet. You know, I want us to act, but so far we just haven't done enough. But you know, by the time that book came out, things have started to change. You know, Biden was on the brink of you know, taking over the White House. Uh, and boy, has he changed things since he's been in power. We're seeing real action now on climate globally. I mean, they're doubling their ambition. The EU's doing the same, the UK the same, uh, Japan's following. And yet here we are in Australia still faffing about, you know, making things worse for ourselves. And you know what really frustrates me, Tim, is I know this government could do it if it wanted to. They proved that when they tackled COVID. I mean, there they were, there we were. Do you remember back in February? I mean, I'd spoken to the chief health officer of the nation just a little bit before on Australia Day, and he was really worried. He's an excellent bureaucrat. And um, he'd obviously advised the prime minister that we need to stop flights from China, you know, in February. Now that had a big economic impact, but it bought us a lot of time. So, but by March, it was clear that the disease was in the country and was gonna start spreading. And, you know, Morrison on the 13th of March, did the big lockdown, you know, we've got to deal with it. And again, the chief health officer was the one who, who really said, you have to do this. And I, I think what he told Morrison was, if you don't act now, you are not going to have the capacity to act in a month's time. It'll be out of control. It'll be out of your hands. So act now. So I didn't know anyone who'd had COVID then. I think very few people did. Very few of us had seen an impact of it. So even though the threat was kind of theoretical for most of us, you know, our government acted and put in this lockdown that had a big impact on people's lives and a massive impact on the economy. You know? And that was sensible because whenever you face a threat like that, 
you know, the first thing is to stop the spread, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. So with climate change, if, if we wanted to act, we've got to stop the spread. We've got to cut the emissions, you know, 7% per year, year on year. We know we can do it. Technologically, absolutely, we can do it. Just needs a political will, like it needed the will to deal with, with COVID. You know, the next thing the Prime Minister had to turn his mind to was, was the state of our emergency room. You know, how, do we have enough oxygen cylinders? Do we have enough critical care beds? Do we have enough doctors, uh, ambulances? You know, how, what's the tracing services like? You know, all of that stuff had to be dealt with. And for climate, it, it's pretty obvious what the, what the critical care is, yeah? Where's, where's our emergency care for the Great Barrier Reef? How's it gonna survive? What about people in uh, areas that are going to be impacted by sea level rise? What about our western suburbs of Sydney that are increasingly hit by heat waves? The bushfires, you know, we, we need a comprehensive government look at all of this to prioritise, to fund, to, to act, you know, because we're doing it all ineffectively at the moment and you can see how desperately we're going to need that emergency room, yeah? Mm. And the third thing we need is a vaccine. And, you know, I remember again back in, you know, April, talking to some of our medicos, the best people in the business, and they were saying, well, you know, I don't know whether we can make a vaccine for a coronavirus. Nobody does. Nobody's ever done it. But what we do know is it's going to be expensive and it's going to take a long time. It's the same for climate change. What's the vaccine for climate change? It's treating our planet better, Tim. It's making sure that our forests are actively growing back, strengthening the drawdown of carbon rather than being cleared as they are at the moment. It's a matter of taking care of our oceans so that the ocean's healthy enough to play its critical role in maintaining the current state of the climate. You know, um, We've got to learn other ways to draw down things. We have to use silicate rocks, most likely, and seaweed you know, to, to draw CO2 out of the air, to strengthen the planetary system to, to, to deal with this crisis. And I'm not seeing action on any of that from our government, or very, very little. You know, really, this whole response to climate needs to become a key focus of government just the way the COVID pandemic did, you know? Otherwise, we are going to face increasing difficulties. Yeah, and that's what I think the book will speak to a lot of people because it's so clear, right? We've got a very tactile, real incident that we can reflect upon and say, right, you essentially just need to do steps one, two, and three, just like you did then, but finally do it for what is the greatest challenge that we face. But you've been trying to use this same rationale for a few decades now, or at least a couple. So, you know, you do talk about in this book, but what are those real handbrakes? What are the absolutely abhorrent practices and behaviours that have and will try again, potentially, to do with exactly what they've done so successfully for the last couple of decades? Well, it's it's the fossil fuel industry, isn't it? It's it's the coal industry. You know, we're the largest exporter of coal here in Australia um, by calorific value of any nation on the planet. You know, we're the largest exporter of natural gas. So there you've got two out of your three fossil fuels that we are the major exporter of, you know. So we do very well from that, that Tim, and yet we sit in this exquisitely vulnerable continent where we know climate change is going to steamroll us if it starts getting out of control. So we're kind of, uh, you know, I used to read storybooks to my kids and there was always, there was a great story I remember about a pirate, very greedy pirate, you know, and he comes to a, a treasure, treasure chest and stacks his, his, his pockets with gold, you know, and they're in the rowboat going back and they hit bad weather and he's got to throw out the gold or sink, you know, and he can't bring himself to throw out the gold, you know, till the last possible second. We're kind of like that. It's very, you know, terrible attitude to things. So we just have to wean ourselves off that and realise that this is really serious. We either act now, this year, or we lose the ability to act in future. The other... Um example in that similar vein that you reference in the book was a story that I hadn't heard before about um, Bob Menzies, Pig Eye and Bob back in the late 1930s and how, um, yeah, maybe you, you're pretty better poised to tell the, the anecdote sure. than me. Well, Menzies back then was the Attorney General. He was soon to be Prime Minister. But, you know, we, had, we were exporting um, pig iron to Nazi Germany and to Japan on the eve of the war. And Australians aren't idiots, right? So the guys who are loading this pig iron into ships to go to Japan, 
just said, come on, this is not, this is not on. This is soon going to be coming back at us as bullets, you know. And so they refused to load the boats. And Menzies said, how dare you try to dictate government policy, you know, and force them to, to load these boats at almost a gunpoint to send the stuff off, you know. And within two years, it was coming back as bullets raining down. It was, he was so addicted to the income, couldn't understand, you know, that we, that we, we, we shouldn't do this. It's very much like coal. The coal we send off now, it'll, it's coming back to us right now in terms of climate change. But we can't wean ourselves from the addiction. So we've, we've had a long history of this in Australia, Tim. It's really, and you know, the other thing, if I could just say that really sticks in my craw is this argument by the fossil fuel industry that, that because we're only 1.5% of the problem or 1.4% of the problem, it doesn't matter what we do, we're never gonna be able to fix it. Well, during the Second World War, Australian troops were 1.4% of the Allied forces. So can you imagine how it would have been greeted if the Australian Prime Minister said, look, you're only 1.4% of the force. It doesn't really matter what you do, guys. Just, you know, take a bit of a break. <laughs> Don't push yourself too hard. Mm, I mean, really is pathetic. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I get a bit agitated when I start thinking about the lies that they tell and how easily they get away with them. Yeah. So fossil fuel, they're incredibly effective efforts in engaging the conversation, the narrative in the media. And you also referenced just the relatively small number of people that are so profoundly under their influence um, in the Australian political landscape. So what is your current thinking in how, and maybe it's current tactics as to how we are addressing this? Who are the leaders of the current and tomorrow who are, who are helping us dismantle this horrific status quo. Mm. Look, we, we are slowly winning the battle, Tim, but it's way too slow. So, you know, we've seen Craig Kelly now uh, step aside. He's not going to, I don't think he'll be elected next uh, year. We've seen um, Christensen from Queensland step down. They can see the way the wind's blowing. They, they're not going to wait to be massacred. You know, Barnaby Joyce is sitting on the back bench. Matt Canavan sitting on the back bench. Abbott's out of the parliament. You know, I've had a few wins, but there's still probably 25 people in that parliament who are holding the nation to ransom. And we have to get rid of every one of them. And I was involved in Warringah with the effort to get rid of Abbott. I was actually going to stand against Abbott um, at, at one stage. I went there and started to organise um, uh, the committee and the financing, and we appointed a campaign manager. But then, you know, Zali Stegall stood up and Zali was so much better suited to the job than me that I was more than happy for her to take over because I'm not a parliamentary creature, I can tell you. I would have done it to get rid of Abbott, but you know, not much else. So I just think we've got to replicate that again and again and again. We've got to vote independents into the parliament who care about climate change. The parties are part of the problem, you know. So we have to just sidestep that and put some real effort into mounting activist campaigns to get independence into the Australian Parliament. Yeah, up, and I, up where you are, Tim. You know, you're in a classic position up up there. Um, you've got um, what's his name? Uh, Jason Falinski. Yeah, Falinski. Exactly. I mean, you should be able to move him along if he's not going to act on climate change. You know. Well, this is it. I think once um, more people are understanding that the the power in the independence is profound. And in many cases, it doesn't take that much. I mean, Warringah was a shining example, obviously Wentworth as well, but it, it, it doesn't take, it's a bit of a formula to follow and you can actually elect an independent, which really shifts the balance of power in this nation. That's right, even threatening them with an independent. So they know that might not go up this time, but next time they're in deep poo <laughs> is very good. It Indeed. moves things along. So I was eager, we, we might let it slide unless you really want to jump in, but you know, a, a, another big example of where your fantastic efforts in the political realm, going back to 2009 with the Copenhagen Climate um, Committee, was it? Council. Council. Yeah. Um, you know, so much work that went into um, COP15, but you, lo and behold, were undermined by some ginormous international uh, plot 
and it was yeah. pretty serious, right? Do you want to tell us a little bit about well, that? Sure. Look, I was chair of the Copenhagen Climate Council for three years, and we held the biggest business summit ever held to this day on climate change. You know, we were supporting the Danish government, and look, lots of things went wrong, but the worst of them was that about three weeks before the big political meeting, the, someone in Saudi Arabia and was collaborating with someone in Russia to produce this climate gate lie where they'd stolen emails from the University of East Anglia, gone through them and selectively taken uh, quotes from them. It made it look as if the climate scientists were kind of fiddling the data. And that was absolutely untrue, but there was no time to disprove it. And you know, at the meeting, I saw how hard that hit because like none of the political leaders were uh, climate experts. And people, people from developing countries, they read that stuff, you know, on the front page of the, the news limited papers and whatever, and they believe it. And so their faith in the reality of climate change was deeply shaken just at the moment when they had to vote, you know? And there were six inquiries developed after, you know, and all of them found the same thing. This was just a, it was fake news, yeah? But um, it was incredibly effective and impossible for us to counter. And that's the way they work. I. I you know, I, I, I didn't know what to do at that point. I don't think I've ever been so depressed because, because I knew that, you know, fail, if we failed at Copenhagen, the road back was going to be tough, it was going to mean steep cuts, it was going to mean a lot more drawdown than I thought we could easily do, you know. And here we are today, at, uh, you know, more than a decade on of following the worst case scenario for emissions, trying to, you know, pull the, the earth out of the fire, really. And um, it's a tough, it's going to be a tough road now, but we just have to do it. Exactly right. So, yes, your rhetoric, the rhetoric, the narrative has transformed. Of course, we need the, the radical cuts to, to stem the spread, but we really do need to take this lens of drawdown. So I would love to just have a bit of a chat about how I suppose you took that pragmatic realization that drawdown was so essential and then you went the academic path and you did the the literature review you you checked out what the solutions were and I I, I think I heard that you know things like the Virgin Earth Prize 10,000 plus submissions and ideas of how to radically draw carbon out of the atmosphere right. and you came up with a handful that you think are, are, are really legit so yeah, maybe tell us a little bit about that, where we're at now and what you're really barracking for when it comes to drawdown. Sure. Well, look, all of the, the projections that the IPCC puts together to achieve, you know, one and a half degrees, 1.8 degrees, two degrees, whatever it is, all of them embed a fair bit of drawdown. And that the, uh, the, num the actual number grows every year we fail to take action because we put more gas up into the air. So at the moment, we're committed to probably about 10 gigatons of drawdown every year for the next 80 years, you know, to get to one and a half degrees or whatever, a stable climate. And that's like, we can't do anything like one gigaton at the moment. Can you know, explain what a gigaton is in a, in a, in yeah, a really, yeah. It, it's a billion tonnes, it's a lot. So just to give you an idea of how big that is, just to draw down one gigaton, and this is using conservative figures really, but you know, you would need to plant a seaweed farm the size of South Australia, right, to get one gigaton. Now you might get three or four gigatons out of it, but you know, conservatively speaking, it's looking like about a gigaton for that size. So you know, this is a big, big enterprise. And yeah, you know, we went through those ten thousand entries, and there was only a handful that were scalable, potentially scalable. You know, and so seaweed is one. Um, another one is the use of silicate rocks, and these are a, a kind of rock that's very common in Australia, forms at mid-ocean ridges. If you can grind it up and spread it on an agricultural field, um, it'll draw, one kilogram of that rock will draw down more than a kilogram of CO2, but also increases the fertility of the crops in that field. So the trials that have just been completed last year in the US shows a 12% increase in crop yields for, for corn, where you spread this rock. And does it so stay the, in the soil then? What, what happens with it after it's done its absorption? It, it's just minerals. It just yeah. forms carbonate minerals in the soil. It's, it's, it doesn't hurt anything. It's quite, uh, quite simple. but. Um, so that, that's all good, but the, the trouble is to grind up, to quarry the rocks and grind it up. At the moment, we have to use fossil fuels. This is why I'm so desperate for us to move on to a clean electricity generation and transport sector, because once we've got that, these other opportunities become unlocked. You know? 
Mm. And, and so that's, that's where we need to be with that sort of stuff, you know. And seaweed farming, you know, it seems to me such a no-brainer. I can't understand why we haven't started taking advantage of it. You know, there's more genetic diversity in seaweeds than there is in all of the land plants on Earth put together, you know. And, and we're finding they do amazing things and they help heal the ocean. I mean, they stop ocean acidification. So you know, lots and lots to learn and to, to focus on as we move forward. It's so um, easy, right? Once you we go back to the start of the conversation, shifting humanity's uh, you know dial to acknowledge that it's planet ocean, right? There's more volume of of habitable space in the ocean than there is um, in the terrestrial landmass. There's you know it covers seventy percent of the surface, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We want to go and plant forests to draw down carbon. No, we actually need to go the other way and look at how much carbon can be um, sequestered through the ocean. So yeah, while- right. And Tim, you know, the great thing about that is that, you know, in the oceans, if we grow seaweed and we sink the seaweed down a kilometre in depth, it's out of the system. It's, that, that's carbon's out of the system. That's where most of the carbon ends up naturally anyway, you know, in the ocean depths where it's sequestered. Exactly. And we then go and find novel ways to get it back out again and uh, disrupt the balance. So you know, Ocean <laughs> Impact Organization, we don't yet have a, a $25 million prize like the Virgin Earth Challenge or, you know, the X Prize with Elon Musk is $100 million for carbon removal. But yeah. we're out there finding innovative solutions. We had 192 applicants apply to Pitch Fest last year, and mm. I'd say at least 25 of those were seaweed related. Wow. Um, so it is exciting. I think people out there who are particularly uh, next younger generation, they they want to obviously secure their own future for them and their kin, but also to be leaders in their own right and pioneers of new solutions. So yeah, maybe um, if anything comes up, what sort of solutions have you seen around Australia or what are you picking up from your sphere where younger and people maybe who are in existing industries are kind of going, yeah, I'm going to switch my focus and try and be an entrepreneur for the future. Uh, look, it's amazing what's happening out there, Tim. i just give you two examples from Australia. One uh, involves a group called Ocean Forests. It's a Tasmanian-based company run by Sam Alsom. Sam sea used forest. to be a sea forest, fashion... Yeah. Sea forest, sorry. Yeah. Sea forest. Did I say ocean forest? Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> sea forest. Yep. Yeah, sea run by um, uh, uh, Sam Elsom, who used to be a fashion designer. He's growing a red seaweed called asparagopsis. And you feed that seaweed to cattle and it, it reduces their methane emissions by 98% and helps the cattle grow faster, be healthier and everything else. It's just fabulous stuff. So they're in trials at the moment, which is good. The other one, the company I've really been taken with is Young Henry's, you know, the brewer, the brewing company, who are capturing the CO2 from the brewing process and using algae to, to capture that, that carbon and then find uses for it. And it's just kind of innovative stuff, you know. I'm really impressed. It's out of the University of Technology, Sydney. So, so they're just a couple of examples of people who are thinking differently about their business and how they go about it. Yeah, and we, um, we had Dr. Alex Thompson from the UTS Deep Green Biotech Hub on the podcast last year, and she told us all about that. And also... Um, you know, initiatives, they did a great display at Vivid and Splendor in the, on the grass. So they're taking the science sort of into the mainstream and in doing so, inspiring so many people to not just understand the solution, but to think about their role in um, the solution. Back to sort of uh, Sam Elsom, because you and I, I mean, obviously, so from my side, so familiar with all your work, but it was it was Heron Island and a climate change immersion coordinated by the Climate Council and some fantastic um, next generation Australian philanthropists where we met. And that was also, if I think about some of the alumni, um, Sam Elsom is a, is a Heron Island alumni. We've got right. um, you know, Matt Bate, who's got an incredible book now. I think you helped out with a little bit, just with, with a little kelp from my friend. I did friend. indeed. Yeah, yeah. You know, That's there's Heidi Leinfer from Cloud Control who set up the Feet Artists. You've got Surface for Climate was born out of it. Jack River, really quite amazing experience. Um, tell us a little bit about why, I suppose, you, you know, you can, you can exert your energy in so many different fields, but you do choose, even with your work with Australian Museum, you choose to invest a significant amount of time and energy 
in activating people who will go on to have that capacity to make a difference. Um, why is that the case and, and, and what, what gets you fired up about it? Look, I, I really, I, I love the energy that young people bring to, to this sort of stuff and the, the risk taking attitude. They've got lots of time in their life. So they kind of, you know, they can, they can afford to take something on as a bit risky. You know, they do the due diligence of it, but they can afford to take it on. And if it doesn't work out exactly as the way they thought, then they've got time to change tack a bit, you know? So I just find it, it it's fantastic, Tim. I mean, people like yourself, we met up there and, and um, others. I just love to you know, talk through. I mean, they're, they're often they're their ideas. All I am is a sounding board for people really, you know, and I can offer a bit of, you know, sounding board and a bit of assistance, but it's them and their energy that carry it forward. And, and that, 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 that's what we, we'll do. You know, you see, you see what people have done in the tech sector. That's just a little taste of what we're gonna do in the carbon sector in future, I reckon. And we've got a really great opportunity here in Australia to lead in that. So, so mm. yeah, that's why I do it. And just to sort of dive a little bit deeper into that, I mean, I went to Heron Island, you know, already feeling like quite an a, a accomplished environmentalist. I had a, a successful charity and everything seemed to be on track. But over the succession of this two to three days of, um, of deep learning and deep connection and consultation, I was naturally like all those other alumni and many more I mentioned, I, I was rattled to, to reflect upon that and what that next iteration was. And, and lo and behold, OIO is, is, the, uh, is the outcome. I, I opened my network. I spoke to people who knew of others doing bold, visionary things. I met Nick and, and here we are two and a half years later. Um, so I suppose, you know, for me, at the core of that was this realisation that my existing focus was so much about activating civil society. It was the education that was the inspiration, but I just couldn't see how the solutions were really going to radically scale, which is why now going into startup innovation and investing in these, um, these new ecosystems simply has to be the way forward. And it sounds like, you know, with your reference then to the, what's going to happen in the carbon space, that is like a, it's inevitable, right? We're going that way and we're going there fast. That's right. We'll either do that or we'll face um, some sort of environmental collapse, I fear. But anyway, yeah. we shall see. But this, this year, the next year, the one after are pretty key, you know, particularly the Glasgow meeting. Uh, if the nations of the world get on board, um, we'll be in pretty good shape, I think, to, to put in the effort that's needed to avert, you know, two degrees. Let's talk a bit more about that. COP26 coming up this year, big changes in the global political landscape. Um, what do you know is happening? What do you sense is happening as we go through this uh, the remainder of this year into next year? Uh, look, there's been a real ground shift, Tim. Um, you know, it's been pushed in part by Biden, but also by the Europeans. I mean, you know, they've realised that if you're going to take on serious emissions reductions, that comes at a cost. And you need to protect your industries from the cheaters, those who want to just keep on doing business as usual and sending polluting material into your market. So they're all looking at border adjustment tariffs, carbon border adjustment tariffs, where they say, look, if you tax the carbon in whatever you're sending us, that's fine, we'll accept your stuff. If you don't tax it, we'll tax it at the border. And that I think will change everything. Um, it's gonna mean Australia can't just be the dirty exporter uh, that we, we've been so far. So we either get with the program or we, we end up with the, you know, the petro states with the Saudi Arabia and Russia and a few other, you know, laggards. Who holds that, um, that revenue from that taxation if it happens on the other oh, the side Europeans the will just take it. They'll just do it as a tax on the border. I mean, if we tax it, we keep the revenue. You know, so if we had a carbon tax, we'd keep the revenue. But mm. if, if we don't do it and they have to impose a tax, they'll keep the revenue. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So... All right, so there's lots happening around that one. What about with you sort of personally? What have you got sort of coming up in this next um, phase of your unique life's journey? What are you working on now? What's next for you? Well, look, I've, I, I, there's still a job to be done in Australia. I'm keen to do some work in regional Australia, just bringing communities together because I've seen the power of that, you know, of doing that. It's fantastic if you can get the community to come together around a vision. Um, I also want to do some work in West Papua. There's a real job to be done in terms of protecting forest up there. I've done similar work in the Solomons and PNG, but I want to move on now to Papua. 
Um, so yeah, there's there's a lot to be done. <laughs> not a, not much time. <laughs> It is the case. And uh, in the interest of that, you know, we're all enjoying having Tim Flannery in our little earbuds today, but the man is a busy man. So I think we're going to just uh, celebrate what was a really great uh, chat. Um, I'd love to send it back over to you, I suppose, Tim, just to discuss anything you wanted to get to today, but haven't and uh, some closing words and obviously um, feel free to spruik anything that um, is relevant. Well, I just say, Tim, you know, this is the year. If you're thinking about doing something for climate, sure, buy a solar panel, an electric car or whatever else. But also, can you give us some of your time, right? We need to change the political landscape in this country. And just voting is not enough anymore. You know, we all need to go and see our local member and have a real serious conversation with them and say, what, what are you going to do about climate change? Not your party. You don't want to hear about the impediments. I want to know what you are going to do in this parliament to, to avert this crisis. And if the answer is not good enough, you need to say to them, well, it's not good enough and I'm going to have to work against you. I'm putting 10% of my time this year into politics. I'm going to be supporting an independent candidate to get rid of you because you're not reflective of what's required. You're not up to what's needed in the parliament now. And then find that independent candidate, find a group of like-minded people, put that time in and create the change. Mm. Is there a, a central destination you would encourage? Obviously, it starts with looking at your local um, electorate and obviously having that conversation. But if you are looking at the, the groundswell movement around independents being elected, mostly in, um, in coalition seats, where is there a destination people can go to? Uh, look, there are a group of people um, who are the voices of group. I would Google them. There's about 26 of them in electorates around Australia. Um, some are more advanced than others. Obviously, Zali Stegall's a great success so far, but there's many others as well. So um, just start doing a bit of investigation online. Start putting together your, your, your groups in your communities and um, we can get this change. Or we, if we had two or three Zali Stegall's at the last election, we'd be living in a different world. The government would be a minority government dependent upon people who deeply cared about climate change. But as it is, they got this you know, razor thin majority and we can take that away from them next time, make it a different world. Yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. You've got some calls to action there, folks. Um, and obviously the Climate Council, just an incredible resource. Uh, if you are coming to this with, um, you know, a little bit of unknowns, uncertainty about where to go, it's not a bad place to start and you are the chief councillor there. So Thanks so much, Tim. I should have spoken to council as well. <laughs> Thank you for doing it for me. Uh, no worries at all. I'm pretty much happy on my side. You happy on yours? Any closing words? No, that's it, Tim. That's great. Thank you so much. Great to see you again. Thanks, mate. Thanks everyone for tuning in and uh, big, big love to you, Professor Tim, and keep up. We know you will. <laughs> Thank you. Take the ocean out of me